good air of Shabbos. Isn't that a lovely way to be able to start? And even more than that, better than that. For me, I just got off the airplane and um, literally just about a few hours ago, um, had the most amazing gift of being able to be in Eretz Israel. I was just looking to see if my mother got on screen, but if she didn't, it means that my stepfather wasn't there to put her on screen at this time. And we're still, we're still learning how to be able to do this all um, ourselves. And, you know, all the tests and everything that Hashem sends and gives us, including with this wonderful, um, you know, wonderful technology, which is really how we all here this evening. So um, I really just want to say that this is a wonderful, wonderful, very exciting for, for me personally, to have wonderful Danielle here. Um, I've known her for many, many years. And um, I do have to say that it was her sister, Regine, that um, I got to meet um, first. And just watching people in our world, in, in the world that we live in, um, I could certainly say that there are many people that we want to be able to pick out and say, wow, you know what, this person is just a person of personal growth, um, of beauty inside and out. Um, who has made so many different changes for herself um, that have affected um, her family and the world that we all live in. So I'm not going to tell you much more about wonderful Danielle um, before while she's here, because I think that that is something that we are here this evening to be able to listen, learn and take away, as we always do, our own personal um, lessons from everyone and and everything that happens in the world. So um, with that, um, we're going to invite Danielle to come and join us and speak to us right here this evening. Um, Zippy, if you're there for me. Ah, oh, there we go. And as I say to Danielle, it would be really nice if as many of you as possible will keep your screens on because we never know who we're really speaking to. And I was listening to a share last night at my sister's house. <clears throat> and um, Rabbi Smith was teaching and he said, look, you know, I don't even know how many of you are awake, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I, I told Daniel that our group of ladies are very special. And for me, it's very special because everybody wants to join us on a Thursday night, whether they're baking, taking a break um, or just here to be, you know, for all of us to be inspired and ready to inspire ourselves. So thank you for joining us, and I'm going to hand over to you. Hi, can you hear me? Have I done everything correctly? You so far have done everything correctly. Can everybody, if there's anybody that can't hear properly, I think maybe, can you just come a tiny bit closer to your mic? That's for me. Me, okay, so I feel like I'm in, I'm in everyone's room. <laughs> you are, you are. Beautiful thing. We're all together in our homes, and um, and you've got Manchester, Israel, London, um, even even Edgeware, Edgeware, you know, we yeah. you know, it's not London, so let's go. And uh, it's very special to have. I think we, we usually have Gibraltar, so you know, and and people from America. So you know, we are, we are an international group of wonderful women, all of us. It's such an honour to to. I can't believe I'm actually speaking to you all. Usually, I speak to um, six formers. That's my become a little bit of my specialty to speak to them about my life. Um, so I'm a little bit nervous to speak to contemporaries. Um, so you'll bear with me if I get a little bit tongue tied or nervous, because I also have never done anything on Zoom before. It's a very weird experience to not see people in person and to, I, can, I can see myself a bit. It's very strange. But anyway, so, um, so I'm going to speak a bit about um, my journey, um, meaning not necessarily just my Jewish journey, just life journey, and um, and I hope that I can be I can be brave enough to be truth truthful enough that um, it will resonate with some of you, my feelings, my thoughts, my my what lies behind all the things that, that I have done, um, and I'm gonna try and be really truthful about it. Um, so as a child, I grew up um, in London with, um, I have one older sister and um, my parents, and we lived very Jewishly traditional. So, so 
we didn't keep anything, no Shabbos, no kosher, no, none of that. Um, we would sit down for Friday night dinner and my father was extremely involved in the shul. So it was a very, it was, it was strange. We, we weren't religious at all, but my father has dedicated his entire life to Holland Park Synagogue, which he is the honorary president of. And, and he looks after the whole community and he's just, that's his life's work. Um, and, um, and to put some, some other things into perspective, there was, um, growing up, he, um, I used to notice as a young child that often on a Sunday morning, my father would get a phone call, the phone would ring, and he would, um, he would jump out of bed and be gone for a few hours. And, um, and I didn't really understand, I never really even bothered to ask until I was a little bit older. And, and basically what my father also has dedicated his life to doing is he's the Hevra Kadusha for the Sephardi community, which I, I, if someone doesn't know what that is, it, he, he basically gets called when someone in the community passes away and he washes them and um, prepares them for burial. Um, and I just, I, when he actually told me what, what he did, I, used to, I didn't find it strange or weird. I found it hugely just like, wow, you do that? I want to do that one day. It sounds amazing. So, um, so he had a big impact on me. Um, so growing up, I was um, quite an underachiever. And I had a big sister who was a big overachiever. And there was just the two of us. And I literally spent my life comparing myself to her and her achievements. Um, I was dyslexic, I am dyslexic, I'm a proud dyslexic now, and um, I found it, um, school was so hard, I almost so hard that I used to just not be in, I was in school, but I wasn't in the lessons, I just wasn't there, um, and in those days it was, okay, it wasn't so long ago, but it was, um, people didn't understand dyslexia they they I was told why can't you be like your sister and and it was misbehaving and and it was just it was very un, not understood anyway so my self-esteem always has been very low and um then when I got to senior school um again it was very difficult I remember one of the, the changing points in my life, if I'm being very honest, is that, and I feel, I feel still ashamed of it now, is I found tests so difficult that I would, um, that one day I couldn't take it anymore and I cheated in an exam and I got caught and um, I got sent home for the day and my parents were fine. My parents dealt with it quite well, actually. But when I got back into school, the teachers humiliated me and they said you don't you know don't want to do what Danielle did in front of in front of lots of people um and but what it did do was at that point I really believe it was a turning point I thought to myself I am going to show everybody I hate everybody so much that I'm going to show them what I can do and that I'm that, I, that I'm just going to show them I don't know what that meant then anyway I'm going to try and move it along a bit. So um, by the time I got to GCSEs, I realized that, that even though other subjects were hard for me, I loved art, I loved painting. So I did very well in art. I actually did very well in, in my GCSEs, surprisingly enough. I, I worked so hard, harder than anybody else. I put more hours in than anybody else. I just, I made myself remember things. I, I just, I put so much in and I got good A level, a good GCSE results, but art I found easy. It was just, I loved it. And so A levels, again, I worked so hard and I, and I achieved really good grades for, um, just for anybody I achieved good grades, but it was through perseverance and wanting to show everybody that I could be like everybody else. And, um, and then I, and I, and I did my art A level and I, and I did very well in that. I got an A and, and I, and I just decided that I obviously I needed to go to art school. That was the only thing I was really, really good at. And um, so I applied to what's called a foundation course, which is um, where you go for a year and you do a combination of all the different arts, graphic design, fine art, fashion design, everything. 
And um, I really wanted to be a fine artist. I wanted to be a painter. And then, um, but then um, I did my slot for fashion. There was a fashion slot. You did two weeks of each subject. And it was an amazing teacher. And she, she showed me how during, during the fashion illustrations, which is a lot of what fashion design is, you're basically painting a picture. It's about color and proportion and all the things that I love about painting, but she showed me how to do it in a fashion avenue. Um, so anyway, so I ended up specializing in um, my foundation in fashion. And I was the only person in my class to get a distinction in fashion. Um, and so I, I, I excelled and, and again, worked so hard to excel. It wasn't something that came completely naturally. It was a lot of hours. Then I, um, I stayed at the same university, which is Kingston University to do my BA honors um, in fashion design. And um, the professor of the university, the, the fashion part of the university, the professor, it was a man called Ian Griffiths. And he is still today, the um, creative director of Max Mara. Um, and, you know, it was, a, it was, he was, he was very, very, very tough. He, he worked us really hard. We, it was, it was an intense three years. It was the best three years really of my entire life. There was nothing else I needed to do, but focus on that. I loved it. And um, I think the teachers saw that my dedication to it was slightly different to maybe most of the class. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that I don't know whether it was really coming from a healthy place, that drive I had. It was coming from a place of, I need to show, I don't know who I wanted to show. I just needed to show myself, someone else that I was worthy of. I was just worthy. And, and in the world that I grew up in, that meant being successful in your job. It didn't really mean anything else. So, um, so I did it. And then at the end of the three years, I graduated with a first, the only person in my year to graduate with a first. And there were more talented people there. There were more talented people there than me, but nobody worked as hard as I did. Um, and, um, and I was awarded 3000 pounds from the Royal College of Art to continue my, my career. Um, I also won um, a dis my, the dissertation prize I won uh, about a thousand pounds for that. And I also won the Max Mara prize for, um, I don't know, achievement. So I came out pretty good at the end of that. And um, at the end you do a fashion show as well as your, as well as your drawing work. And, um, and basically it's a, it's, a, it's a way of other of companies to come in, coming to see new talent and, and who they might want to employ. So at that time I was offered a job at um, Armani wanted me to come and work for them. And Benetton wanted me to come and work for them. And Gucci wanted to interview me. I didn't get any further than the interview, but they, they interviewed me, which was quite exciting. And the professor of the university said, I don't want you to take any of those jobs. I want you to come and work for me in Italy and be my assistant in Italy. So, um, so I took that job because I knew him, it felt safer. It was, it just sounded like an amazing opportunity. So I went to, I lived in Italy for a, a, only over about a year, but it seemed like like five years. And um, it was quite lonely out there. And, and it was a bit of a shock. It was a bit of a shock to a Jewish, <laughs> Jewish girl who hadn't been, had never lived outside of her house before. Um, but it was an amazing experience. And, um, and because I didn't want to stay in Italy any longer, I was finding it quite difficult. Um, not the job, the, the lifestyle of it, the language, the everything. I, um, I wrote to the, it's so funny, I wrote, I didn't, I literally, I didn't email anyone. I wrote a letter to the people in England that I would like to work for, which was really only Burberry and Paul Smith. I don't know if you, if you know those people. And, um, and, I wrote, I literally wrote them a letter and I got response from a letter <laughs> and I was asked to come back to London to interview with both companies and I was offered jobs at both companies. However, I 
there was something about Paul Smith that was just so exciting. The offices. I don't know if you've ever seen any documentaries on him. He is mad. I mean, good, good mad. He is. It's you go to the offices. There's there's toy trains on the windowsills and colourful walls, and it's just so amazing. And um, and Burberry is much more um, corporate and white and 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 I and I think um, so. Paul Smith won out, and now what? What they wanted me to do was be the assistant designer to the creative director of women's wear. So the person who does all the puts the shows together and all the women's side of it, there's this woman on the top, at the top, and she had been doing all the design by herself until the point where Paul Smith said, you need someone to train up. And she was very reluctant. She did not want me there, but I think in the interview, she saw that I had enough humility to not step on her toes. Um, so I, I went to work for her. She made it very, I felt clear that, that she didn't need me and she didn't want me and she could do it all by herself. And, and it was very much, and I'm really not joking, it was very much like the film The Devil Wears Prada. I don't know if anyone's seen that film where, um, you know, a boss that was just, a tyrant but what I did was I, I I worked my socks off I made the tea I I made I made her bookshelves beautiful I did everything I stayed there till the lot I didn't leave the office until she left the office which was late and I tried to get there before she came in and I think I won her over by literally being just being dependable and I and I and I say to the girls in the sixth form forms I, I think people expect people expect to just walk into jobs and have some and be doing something that they that they want to do and it doesn't work like that you you do you finish your a levels and if you're given the opportunity to have a job that is somewhere that you, that what you where you want to work you just do anything and you make yourself trusted and you make yourself available and you and you give it your all and i and i really think that's the key to um climbing up the ladder um, and, and soon she started to give me proper design work to do. And then, and then she knew I was a good designer because she interviewed me and wanted me, but she didn't give me the opportunity to do it until, until I gained her trust. And then the rest is history. She was still very tough on me. She taught me everything I know. And, um, and it was amazing. But the end of, by the end of about four years at Paul Smith, um, there was... I think in that fourth year, something changed within my family. So, so my sister that I mentioned, I have one sister, she, um, she started not being, I was living at home at the time and she, she started not being at home on weekends. And I didn't, I think I was so self-obsessed. I didn't even really no, notice that much or care, but there was a certain point where I did notice that she wasn't there a lot and, and, um, and I'd ask her and, and my mum would say, well, she's going to Golders Green. And, and I'd be like, well, where, yeah, yeah, where's Golders Green? I, I honestly, I knew Golders Green as Carmelis, somewhere that you'd go at the end of a Motse Shabbos, Saturday night, and you'd go and get bagels. Um, so it was interesting, like, why was she going there? What was she doing? And then, and then holidays, she started also to go, um, any time that she had off her own work, she would go to Israel and be there for a week. And I'd be like, who is she staying with? What is she doing? This is so strange. Um, but eventually, I think she was she was in Israel and I, I knew that she was there to date people. <laughs> and um, I, was, I was so clueless. I was so clueless. And um, I remember being on the phone to her and she, she, you know, she would often speak to me and be like, uh, uh, like a bit teenagery, but she wasn't a teenager, she was a fully grown woman. And, um, but once I spoke to her, I said, how's it going? What's happening? I said, did you go, you know, did you go on a date again? And she went, yes. And she was giggling and it's really not like her at all. And um, I just remember that so specifically that she was all giggly and lovely. And anyway, she came back from Israel after dating someone for a couple of, a couple of times. And then, I don't know, a month later, he's coming to England. And this boy is American and he lives in, he, he, was, he was at the mayor learning in Israel. He's, come, he's coming to Israel, he's coming to England. So I still didn't quite know what that, that meant and how fast that would mean things would go. But 
he came to meet us and so this boy with a black hat on enters enters our house and I think the only reason why my mother didn't throw him out was he was quite good looking <laughs> so my mother was like oh okay I could I, I could just about handle this um and um and that's the superficial world I lived in that that, that you know that it, it, you know you can trust someone on how they look um anyway so he entered our lives and three months later she was engaged and my parents were making a wedding and that's when I got to spend a bit more time with my sister and this this um man Yosef Lynn and he um and the main point I'm bringing this up for is that when I when I saw them and how they was how they how they responded to each other how they responded to my parents how their relationship was there was something about that that really stuck with me and I was like that looks really nice and my sister is being so insightful now and 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 she's seeing me in a different way and and she's caring about us all in a different way and and it was just it really 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 felt that can you hear shouting in the background if you can hear shouting in the background that's my children I haven't got things so right yet but anyway um anyway okay so fast forward so she I'm working at Paul Smith everything is crazy manic I'm doing shows I'm working all weekend doing shows I mean to the to the extent that my hands are like bleeding the, honestly I, I I would it was so physical getting ready for a fashion show it was unbelievable and um you know I'm meeting people like I'm under I'm undressing people like Kate Moss and and you know the big the big supermodels and um just to point out there was there's also there were moments in that that were very interesting where I realized that um these these girls came in came into our room where we would see whether they were right for the show or not and it was a bit like cattle lining up for for on display they would walk up and down in front of us um then they would go to the side and take off their clothes it was like they were numb to being undressed i mean it was it was it, maybe there was a male in the room but I, that wasn't what struck me it was a very it was very this is my job this is just my body and I'm taking everything off and putting it back on again. And, and I'm there doing up the skirts and doing, doing all my bits. And I don't, I don't know whether, I, I wasn't appalled by it at all. I just thought how, I, I don't understand how you can do that. And I'm now reflecting on it. I think, I think it was very much that, that they could, um, you can desensitize yourself to anything. Um, so, Okay, so I, I don't, sorry, I'm sounding a bit chaotic. So, so that's happening at work. And then there's this whole religious thing happening at home. And then it comes to the point where my sister is um, getting married. And um, I also remember being in the, in the shawl and there were some, there were some ladies from, from his side of the family there. And, and my sister whispered to me, she said, do you, do you see that that woman is wearing a wig? And I said, what do you mean wearing a wig? Who wears a wig? Why are they wearing, what, what do you, I, I, again, the concept was not, was so new to me. And um, okay, so, so that was just something that stuck out that I didn't know what that was. And then in the shawl itself, now weddings for me have always been very much about, first of all, do I look okay? Is what I'm wearing okay? Uh, what's the party gonna be like afterwards? who's there what's there how's it S strange thing not strange just obsessed with 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 visuals and so the wedding takes place and at, at the end of the wedding when he broke the glass it was like it was electric like no other wedding I had ever seen and I'd been to a lot of weddings I'd never seen anything like it he broke the glass I also watched because I was under the hooper when when my sister and him held hands. It was again, it was electric. I, I, I could see, you could feel it. You could see it that they'd never touched before and they were holding each other's hands and it was just amazing. And there was this whole 
group of men wearing black hats, like a whole sea of them in the shawl, which our shawl doesn't, hasn't experienced before. And they went bananas. Like, usually the shawl is the boring part. It went bananas in the shawl. Everyone's throwing their hats up in the air. Everyone's throwing hats, they're screaming, they're going, they're going mental. And it, it was just, I loved it. I loved it so much. Um, and I thought to myself, I want that. I really want that. Like, who's going to cheer for me when I get married and all that business? Because it just was, it was new. Um, so fast forwarding again a bit, we, we, um, I'm working at, I'm working at Paul Smith and my sister goes off to live in Israel with her new husband. And just before she leaves, she said, for goodness sake, Danielle, look at you, you're in a state, just go and hear something inspirational. And until then, I was like, it, it was too, it was too caught up with my sister. But when she left the country, I thought to myself, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something. So um, she, so like on at about, after leaving work at about eight o'clock, um, I started going on the train to Golders Green and I rocked up at the JLE where, um, where, of course, Rabbi Tatz was. And so like, who isn't inspired by that? Cause he's just so clever as well. When someone doesn't know something and then they're just greeted with kindness and, and, and exciting things to hear that I hadn't heard before. And it was just very inspiring. And also there were other, there were other members of the JLE at the time who were just so not interested in what I was doing work-wise. They were very interested in just being nice to me because I'm a person and it just it felt really it felt really nourishing um so I started going more and more and more and um my dear husband now was dragged along with me because I've been dating my husband since I was at school <laughs> and um we we were brought up very in a very similar way and I said um I said sorry but you're gonna have to before telling me that I'm I'm nuts, you're gonna to have to come and see for yourself. And um, and although we've been on very different journeys, we have ended up with um, in the same place. And um, yeah, so so he's being dragged along. My sister's in Israel, and I'm in this job that is is literally killing me. Even though I love designing, and I. Um, and I, so what happened next? And so I started putting things out for, to try and see if I could change jobs. And um, I was offered a job as the senior designer of Karen Millen, which I thought was quite exciting because I had only ever done catwalk shows before, like the catwalk side of things. And this was much more commercial. So I, I realized that I could learn something new there. And, um, and so I took the job. And at that point, it was in that year that I got married to my husband and I started covering my hair, um, which was very, very challenging. Um, I think the only reason that it was a little less challenging was because I was somewhere new. So they didn't know what I looked like before or after. Um, and I've got to say, once I did it, it was so, nobody had a clue. Just like I was clueless, nobody had a single clue. So um, in fact, it's very awkward when someone compliments your hair and it's not your hair. <laughs> wow, what products do you use? It's so beautiful and bouncy and this and the other. Like, oh my God. I'm like, so I'm, I'm trying to improve myself and not be a liar, but you just have to lie because it was too difficult to, Say the truth because you know whatever it was just it was that was too much for me anyway so so i was obviously going through all these changes and um and the senior designer of caramel and that was very interesting it was a, again it was it was actually more cutthroat at caramel than it was anywhere else so far it was competitive it was very much based on sales so you design a certain amount and then everyone would know how many because caramel and you're selling in it they're thousands so you design a skirt and you get like a few months later when it goes into the shops, you'd get reports as the from, from the headquarters of like, you've sold a thousand of these or we've sold none. And they would then do a whole meeting 
with everybody in the company practically to say to like out you almost of this was a failure and this was a success and that was that was really challenging and they used to put it like that they used to hang up the clothes and put like loser winner in front of different pieces of clothing and um I found that quite challenging. I also found there was everywhere that I've worked, there's always somebody, especially at Canon, there was one guy who was also a senior designer of something slightly different. He, he hated me. I don't know what, maybe he was anti-Semitic. I don't know. But he hated me. He hated what I stood for. He hated everything about me. He hated the fact that they took me to Hong Kong and I, and they, they ordered kosher meals for me. and. Um, they did all sorts of things to facilitate me and 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 sharpness and everything and 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 actually it's important also to say i'm losing track it's imp important to say that each step of the way i'm going to go back to paul smith sorry when i was starting to keep sharpness i did things like you could do this then i i had a cubicle of my own in the paul smith office and i started on a friday night lighting candles in the office as my, that, that for me meant I was keeping something of Shabbos. Um, and, I'd, and I'd use the electric door to go through after I'd lit the candles when I was ready to go and I'd walk home with my rucksack and my phone and my, my everything, but I'd walk home. And it, it was all sorts of like little weird things that I did. And then, and then it got, I had an assistant at Paul Smith and she would, she would also, I'd like the candles and she'd know what I was doing. And then instead of, we had fobs for all the doors. So I couldn't get out without using a fob. So my assistant used to have to stay with me on a Friday to let me out the door. And then it got to the, and then it got to the point where um, I didn't want to go into work on a, on a Shabbos. And when it's, that's usually fine anyway, but on, on sh and showtime, the few weeks le leading up to a catwalk show, everyone is in the office from morning to night on a Saturday and Sunday. And this, this very scary woman that I worked for, I had to say, will you, will you understand if I said that I didn't want to work on Saturdays anymore? How could we make that work? I thought I was going to be fired. She was so fine about it. You, she said, as long as you get your work done, do it and come in all day Sunday, she used to say to me, you'll be there Sunday, um, which was extraordinary because other things she was still very harsh on me about, but that somehow she accepted. I think she saw that it was real. And I think when people see something that's real um, and non-negotiable, they have a respect for it. And that and that I found the whole way through. So when I, sorry, so when I went to, um, to Karen Millen, I had to at some point have the conversation to say, there are, I will not be able to work on Saturdays. I will have to leave work at 12 o'clock on a Friday for the whole of the winter months. Um, and again, I thought I'm not, you know, they've offered me the job, but now I'm telling them this bit of information, this is where it's gonna go pear shaped. And it didn't, the, the, the company director was like, okay, if you, can, if you can do it, you can do it. We'll see how it goes and we'll, and we'll do whatever we can. And, and you've got to remember, this was, it was quite a long time ago. There wasn't so much, um, it, there wasn't so much, no one was so scared to offend anyone then. Um, there, you wouldn't have been in trouble if you'd have said, no, we don't want a religious Jewish girl working for us that's going to take half days and still get paid the same amount money but it just happened and it was okay and, and again I think that is definitely to do with if you show people that you will make up the work and you'll be there and you're reliable um it was okay and 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 like I said um we would go on these long trips to China and Hong Kong and they would they would get me food and um and I would not have to come out of the room on I mean it was hard at one one Shabbos I was in it was I was in Hong Kong on a Shabbos and I literally was locked in a room for the whole of Shabbos. I couldn't get in. I mean, I couldn't get out, so I couldn't get back in. I was very unknowledgeable then of how to, how I could manage it. And I, and I would, and I would just 
be in a room for a whole day and they and my team would come and check on me but they didn't you know they really could have if someone if someone that worked for me now was so had such strange ways I'm not sure that I would have been as that I still even now would be as as amenable as as these people have been and and I think um really credit to we need to show credit to people who are not from our religion it's not all about being you know unkind to to Jews and this and that. I've really found people be so respectful and so helpful of my journey um within the working place um and so so fine so so now we're we're, we're I'm at Caramillon and um and then after a few years at Karen Millen, I felt like it was time to move on again. And I was asked to um, be the head of a certain part of Aquascutum. I don't know if people, if there's a big shop of Aquascutum on, on Regent Street. It's quite like Burberry. It's very, um, it originates from, from trench coats and, and outerwear. And then it's become a catwalk label from then. And um so I went to work for them. And again, I had to have that horrid conversation that the, the guy that, that employed me, the, 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 the most senior person, he um, now he works for um, Dian von Furstenberg. He's the creative director. But these people were like really were like big people. And also the, the woman, that the tyrant I worked for, at, um, Paul Smith, she is now the she directs coach in America, the, um, you know, the bag company coach. And, um, and the woman I worked for at Karen Millen, who was the head of Karen Millen is now, is now part of the team, team of um, people at Vogue who, um, what's it called? They, they have all these amazing um, networks where they get committees of people together to find new talent and things. And, and she works with um, Edward, um, who's the, I can't even remember, the, the head of Vogue, the editor, the editor in chief of Vogue in England. Anyway, she works there. It's like, and then there's little me with my Shabbos and my kosher and my whatever, and everyone's being really nice. So I'm at Aquascutum, and at this point uh, in my life, um, I'm married and I am pregnant with my first child. And, um, and yeah, I'm still obviously learning. I'm keeping Shabbos and doing everything. I'm, I'm pretty from by then and um, very from by then. And I, and I went on maternity leave after I had my first child. And I said to my husband, if we are ever to go to Israel for any period of time, we can go now because, because there isn't, I'm on maternity leave, I can do this. And he somehow agreed and we went and we went to to live in Harnoth next to my sister for we said three months Harnoth was not for my husband it was very it was maybe wasn't quite green enough for him um not the people the 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 ambience <laughs> um but so we ended up moving to Rahavia and being with my sister was amazing. And Paul learnt half day and worked half day. And we ended up staying there for four years. And I said, and I said, I'm just surrounded by so much love that it, it seemed really clear to me that, that going back to what was anyway, fine, I was finding difficult to go back part-time. I didn't, I think some, some people find it easy to go back well, not easy, no one finds it easy. It's, it's either a necessity to go back to work full time and there's no way around it. You have to put your kid in, in nursery or whatever, or you're very driven and you find a way to maybe do four days a week or even five days a week, but still look after your children. And I, inside myself, I couldn't find a way. I couldn't see a path other than because it was so stressful at work. Our fashion, the fashion industry is so stressful, full of wonderful people, not what it, everyone says it is, that I, but I, I said, I, 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 can st I, can st I don't have to go back. I'm gonna, I, I, I can't be up all night with my kid and not, and not um, 
and then still go into work and be there from eight o'clock to eight o'clock. It wasn't a normal job. I couldn't figure out how to do it. And I, so I, I, I left Aquasputum and fast forwarding again, there were four children in, in the period of every two years, there was an, another child, thank God. And, um, but by the, by the time I was pregnant with my third child, Paul and I decided that we needed to go back home and maybe live a little bit more realistically. Um, and we came back to, to London. And um, basically, since then, I've been bringing up my children the best way I know how, which is, which I don't know whether you're interested in this, but you know, if you don't, if you don't come back, if you haven't got a family that is, you know, bringing up from children in in an environment where there isn't necessarily a mother or father who just get it and know what to do and know what to do in your kitchen and 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 look after them in a certain way and not show them certain things that they think are fine and you don't think are fine and it's a it's a bit it's a bit complicated and also there's no there's not really anybody to say um you know, there's no Hinoch in the same way and no Shalom bias in the same, in the same, like someone to learn from. I didn't, it, I didn't grow up with it. So I find that challenging. And thank God there's people like Joanne out there who, um, who can take phone calls at any moment of our lives and, and, and make it okay for us. I think that's really important for the community to keep that, that so strong because, because it's, um, it's a lifeline. And, um, and, so my so after my four children um my husband said you've got you've got to you've got to start being creative again um and i something again said i don't think i can go back into that environment not that the environment was bad it's the intensity of the work that is so hard and i didn't want to go back to and this sounds really snobby and i'm really sorry but i'm going to be trying to be truthful i didn't want to go back to drawing i could get a probably a very good job at Marks and Spencer's drawing trousers, like trousers in all different ways with one with a turned up leg and one with a, that was slim fit and big fit and this fit and that fit with a different button. But that's not really where my passion lies. My passion lies in, in creating really unusual, beautiful things that, that, that are exciting and color and, and all that kind of thing. And um, so I decided to make my own company and, um, and now I have a, a bag company. I and I've always done clothes. This whole story is about clothing, not about accessories. I've always designed a full collection of tops, trousers, coats, that whole thing. Accessories is always a, a, like a unique thing on its own. But um, again, my husband persuaded me that that if we did bags, it wasn't something that I had to mess around with sizes. So it was it's easier to produce. A few bags and then you don't have to worry about producing them in a million different sizes for a million different people so i have this bag, bag company called panny and um it's very challenging because only a fraction of it is um creative and the rest of it is social media and i hate social media if i'm honest um and I'm trying so hard to be, to not be, it's not the influence. I find it, I find that some people can really look at it, be with it and put it down and that's fine. And, and it's not that I can't put it down. The problem is, is if you remember from childhood, again, I'm gonna try and be really honest. I'm a very insecure person and it just feeds into so much and, and it's so much negative stuff. And you never, even, even if I'm just looking at it from a bag point of view, as in fashion point of view, even the fact that you have to follow and have to be in touch with everything that's going on around your area. Um, not like in the old days where you'd have a job, you'd kind of be bubbled and you do your thing and that was it. Now it's, it's to, you have to see your competitors all the time and then you're comparing all the time. How, much, how successful are they? Their photo shoot's better than this. How do I get this person wearing this? But it's really a lot and it's not what sits well with me at all. Um, so, um, so that's when 
I don't know what you want, which one, which way am I going to go first? I'm going to say to you that, first of all, there are, from this story, I don't know how it sounds to you, but, but within achievement, I want to tell you that, that um, it sounds really good and it, and it is really good, but my story is that it didn't come from a good place. Um, and I'm sure many women have achieved great, great things and it's come from stability and, and, and light and all sorts of things. For me, if I'm really honest, every achievement that I ha I've made has been in the pursuit of feeling okay and feeling like I'm not, not, not alone. That's, that's something different. I'll explain that in a tiny bit if I've got time. But being seen, I think much of my life has been about, can people, am I seen? And I do get seen. This asking me to, to speak here, getting a thousand pounds from the Royal College of Art, and this, it does make you seen. It really does. But now in my 40s, I want to say to other people that um, there is a point at which I think we all have to face ourselves. I think some people don't have to face the same things and, and, and maybe they're, they're more aware, unaware, subconscious, all that kind of thing. But I'm very conscious of now of where it all comes from. And it comes from childhood and it comes from, from the first thing that I said about feeling insignificant to my sister. And there's so there's so much so much of my life has been, you know, especially in the from world, I've come to this world where maybe perhaps what I do in a secular environment wouldn't be so impressive because everyone's always trying to just impress, 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 because that's, you know, even if I'm honest, the from world is very impressed by me. My life sounds impressive. And I just want to say that really, it doesn't, it hasn't necessarily come from a great place. And I would love to think that there are, that my children will be so successful in what they're passionate about, but it not come from the same place. And I think that's possible. I think that's really possible to do what you love and to, but, and it not to be, and it not to be um, part of, part of, um, well, basically for it to come from a good place. And that's why I, I think I've become from because it's the, the closest I've ever come to a network of people, a network of, um, of community where you are held together and held up. And to the point at which I, I, I've taken an, another turn in, in what I do. And I was, and I, I feel like I've been brave enough to say that um, perhaps there's there's another part of me that I could be other than I don't have to just be a person of that's a fashion designer and and that's not the only thing I can be in the world um, and I'm I'm now at the moment doing um, a master's in neuroscience in mental health at King's University and it's um, I think I've gone to this place because I wanna understand myself more. I wanna understand people more. I wanna understand the brain more. And funnily enough, I feel like I understand Hashem more because I'm learning all these things at the moment to do with neuroscience and to do with um, what keeps your brain and the cells in your brain healthy. And basically, Chronic stress properly deteriorates your brain and your brain cells and can lead to very many, many different mental health issues, schizophrenia, bipolar, all sorts of things. That's an extreme, but and we know that mental health is a, is a huge, a huge thing in the world. Um, and, um, and so interesting, there's, there's a woman who has just won a Nobel Prize for discovering um, that chronic stress is 
is the cause of, of certain parts of the, your brain deteriorating quicker than people who aren't stressed. And they found an amazing thing that if you, if you um, meditate for three times a day for about five minutes, you, are, you can reverse the damage to a certain extent and your brain is so, it's called plasticity, it's, it's so malleable that your brain grows stronger. Now, what I got out of that lecture was, so you're telling me that Hashem says seven three times a day, which is basically stay still, stay quiet, stay, keep your mind focused, keep your mind not in your problems, in your world, in whatever, focus, stillness, goodness, three times a day. So my interpretation of the most current, this is a Nobel Prize winner of, of like now, the most current scientific knowledge we have about life and how to stay healthy and how to stay good and how to stay everything is to Dublin, basically. And we've given it, we've been given it as, a, as, as davening and other people call it mindfulness. And I just think that's terribly exciting. Um, and, um, and I think that there is, um, there's just huge opportunity to, um, to know that we are not one thing and we can become other things at any other point in our life or we can extend ourselves in different ways. And, um, and that's what I'm trying to do when I'm trying to be truthful and I'm, and my bad company is still going and it's great. And it's, um, but, but I'm, I'm trying to see myself as something else and also understand that, that if no one else can see me, that's also okay. And I can get there through being still, having Shabbos, but in a, in a real way. And, um, and yeah, things are making more sense in my old age. And I think that's it. I don't know how long I've spoken for, whether it was the right amount of time. I can't hear you, Joanne. I know, because okay. as usual, I've got to unmute, you know. Anyway, there, there was, that was really beautiful. And the truth is, I think that the important thing for each and every one of us is, you know, when we, when we see what we have available to ourselves, um, before we go out into the big world, before we really see what's there, if we understand ourselves and what the Torah really gives to each of us and says, use all that you have, use that what is innately natural for us to do, and we can use it. And as long as we use it in that beautiful, powerful way that you've actually taken and you've taken your, your strengths and you've taken the gift that you have with your creativity and now moved it into something different because that's what you need now. Who knows? You know, Penny, by the way, is P A double N double Y. And I, I do wonder, like, well, you know, okay, well, you know, that will be another class all in itself. But, but really, what it is, is that you don't know what you're going to be doing and designing in the next 10 years. And maybe, you know, maybe the whole modern world of modest clothing is not only going to be for us Jewish women, but for, but for the rest of the world as well. So, you know, we just appreciate you with your honesty and the, the struggle, sometimes we forget that, you know, that everybody has their own different personal struggle. And that's what actually helps each of us to really say, we can do it. You know, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Because <clears throat> if HaKadosh Baruch Hu has put us here and if Hashem has put us in the world and whatever he has given us, he's saying, yes, you can. I walked through Yerushalayim and I have to tell you, I said, I don't know, you know, I don't know why a trip hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen. And when it's going to happen, it's going to be with such power because we just take what we have and use it and enjoy it. And, and I think that that's one of the things that really, I felt that really came from, you know, I know your beautiful sister, Regine, I was actually at the wedding. You don't remember me from there, Danielle, so I'm not, you know, but... Yeah. Um, but I remember, you know, before and the dating and all the things that go, but this is the world that really puts us into a place that says each and every one of us are really part of this beautiful world that we have. 
and I'm just going to share this, and I, I just feel that it's, it's quite important. Firstly, I did see my mom, my mother online, so mommy, thank you. Thank you for everything, and it was beautiful being in the same country as you, and I look forward to being back very soon. But I, I, I want to just say that this morning, you know, I wear this necklace from um, Evel, which if you haven't heard the story one day, we'll do that one again as well. And on it's written here on my necklace, Amechad, and on top it's in Amharic, in Ethiopian Amechad. And there was an Ethiopian lady cleaning the bathrooms this morning, and I just said to her, thank you for keeping them nice and clean. And then I thought, hang on a second. And I said, you know, and I said, do you know what this says? I said, and I want to tell you because it's Amechad in Hebrew and Amechad in Amharic. And we are Amechad. And I watched her face change as she was registering what I was sharing with her. And she broke out into this big, beautiful smile and she said, Toda, Toda. You know, and I thought this is what we're all about. Wherever we are, I was supposed to fly in yesterday. Hashem knew the plan that I was really only flying in today. But everything that came with that was that I was able today at the airport to actually help two people. One got on the same flight, one got on a later flight. But Hashem just puts us in different places to use things and to do everything that we can for the best of what mm -hmm. we can do. So, and I just want to say in the Zuchus of this, we should have an Aliyah of Nashamas for Rachel Bas Yisrael and Arya Ben Yehuda, Yehuda, Dov, Yehuda Dov. And Emir Tzashem, the Nashamas should have an Aliyah from all the Nachas that they get from their children and grandchildren and Emir Tzashem many more generations. And together we should all be able to just share the beauty of where we come from, what we do. And, um, and really, Danielle, I think that the beautiful thing is, is that you can show us how you become part of a, a society where we can add to that infrastructure and help people inside to also see it from a more beautiful, special place.